Well, it's mainly our own ideas and you like to put your ideas out. And uh, it is, uh, we, both Henrik and I, have uh, contributed ideas of ours together to this book. Yeah. So, so what is your ideas? Oh, of course, I, I have uh, talked about this old idea by now of, of string theory. Of course, string theory has developed a lot, but it was... Uh, in the beginning, uh, also my idea. Okay, so, so what... what and then the there's, for instance, this random dynamics idea, which I have worked on for long. But I think you should consider that not just one idea, but many. So. Okay, so what is random dynamics? Uh, random dynamics is uh, the thing that you should investigate if some of the principles you believe are really true. In, in the physics you have many great principles and you would like to see if they would come by themselves if you didn't put them in. For instance, we attempted as the first uh, uh, trick in this direction to, to get rotational invariance and Lorentz invariance come out without putting it in. Okay, please and the dream it. of random dynamics is that you hope that all the laws of nature which you learn in physics and perhaps even in other fields should come out by themselves so that you could make a fundamental theory which is completely random and which has not put much in but just uh, could be almost anything because all the great laws we have learned would come out by themselves. Random dynamics is uh, the project of looking at various laws of nature and see if you assume that they are not necessarily there whether they would return by themselves. And the dream is that you could get all the laws of nature returning by themselves uh, and that you wouldn't in a way need any fundamental laws of nature except some random ones or some complicated ones but that the simple laws which we have learned empirically would come out by themselves. Great. This would be a great theory that could almost beat all theories because it could say, ah, if you have a a competing theory which is good and agrees with the laws you know, then, oh, but they all do that. So your theory is just an example of one of the random theories that also develop anyway the laws of nature as we know. But we haven't done that project yet. But um, examples would be like Lorentz invariance and rotational invariance. This fact that when you uh, make your experiment on some uh, disk and then rotate the disk, then um, this will not change the results of the experiments. The laws of the experiments will be the same after rotation. The wild dreams in that, what does that include? Well, I suppose that you could consider random dynamics itself a wild dream without stressing the words much, because it is a dream that I think that most people wouldn't really believe in, but it could be right anyway. So it is a dream, especially this thing uh, that you uh, hope that all the laws of nature we know would come out by themselves without being put in. That is really very much a dream, and the dream has not been established as true yet. So in that sense, it's a wild dream. But you could take special cases to be also wild dreams. For instance, the first example uh, on this project of random dynamics, that is the project of looking for a theory where you don't have rotational invariance and don't have Lorentz invariance put in and then see does rotational invariance and Lorentz invariance come out. And, uh, and the first uh, thing we did about that uh, was to 
think of a theory which is very much like the one you would have inside a crystal. Inside a crystal you have some, if it is a perfect crystal, you have a, uh, some translational environs. It's discretized, but it doesn't matter so much. So you have a, a, a translational environs, but usually in the crystal you don't have rotational environs because the crystal has special directions of the rows of atoms. And uh, they are special, and if you rotate the crystal, uh, well, if you rotate the crystal also, the laws will uh, be the same in the directions along the, the rows. But if you look at one direction along, uh, for a quasi-particle, some uh, wave moving along the direction of the crystal or across it, uh, of the rows of atoms, or it forms some angle, it will in general have a different velocity and the different properties. So the crystal has properties which are different in different directions. And now the question is, if you uh, say that nature was the same, and then you say now compared to the fundamental scale of nature, which for instance for energy would be the Planck scale, and the Planck energy is an energy of the order of uh, of the energy of an express train, and that's very, very much on a single elementary particle. So that means that from this point of view, we are effectively very poor physicists that look only for the very low energy limit. And then you could take a very general theory with translational environments, like you will essentially have inside a crystal for the quasi-particles, and then when you go to very low energy, we get what is called the Weyl equation. If we think of a wave that corresponds to a fermion particle, so it's a little bit specific, but we have done something similar with waves which are bosons, and for those we get essentially Maxwell equations. So we get an equation, Weyl equation, which has the rotational environments and the Lorentz environments automatically. So, Particle for particle or type of wave for type of wave, we get a, a, a theory that has this extra symmetry of rotational invariance, although you didn't put it in. So if you look at the very low energy, you see you see the uh, 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 you see rotational invariance coming out without having been put in. So rotational invariance should come out without coming in. Then there's a lot of comments about that. One of the comments is that you get rotational invariance for three plus one dimensions. So in a way, in excess of that, uh, you got also the prediction, crudely speaking, that you should have three spatial dimensions at one time. And that is very nice. But you also have some weak points because you got this rotational invariance for one type of particle, but unfortunately the rotations are a different type of transformation when you look on another type of particle. So it wasn't quite successful, but it was on the way. It is telling you uh, somewhat about this uh, standard model, which is a model that works very well today. So one, one gets a bit of introduction as to what is this model, which is called the standard model, which is so exceedingly successful today that it is almost shocking. Because the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, uh, where they are colliding protons against protons typically, uh, uh, that experiment uh, seems to confirm the theory we have had for long so well uh, that I think that most physicists are a bit uh, <laughs> disappointed or embarrassed by that because if it agrees so well, then one can be a little nervous. What's, 
why sh what shall we do why shall we find a better theory if we already have such a good one but there is a lot of arguments why you should find a better theory because this standard model which works so well it really has many problems and one of the problems is gravity do you do you yeah you it is for instance the unification with gravity that uh, the standard model is a so-called renormalizable model, which gives sensible results when you ask sensible questions about something that really can be measured. But if you don't ask the sensible questions, or if you don't uh, uh, remember that you should also tell how you measure the parameters in the standard model, which are needed to calculate the results, then you may typically get nonsense results, so-called divergent result, which means you get integrals which don't make sense but becomes infinity, or you, you can say you get something like infinite numbers. I mean, if you say 1 plus 2 plus 3 and continue like that, then you get the answer. Then it would be a sort of nonsense answer. So you get this kind of nonsense answers which are divergent, which are infinite numbers. But if you very carefully find out what you have measured and only describe what you want to measure in terms of the data you really have measured, then the parameters of which there is of order 20 in the standard model has to be determined in order in terms of something you have measured. And then these um, numbers become divergent and nonsense. But when you put them in and predict something else, you get good results. So it is just on the borderline that this theory is satisfactory. But that is typical of quantum field theories, which are the theories you are hoping for. In this respect, the standard, uh, the string theory is somewhat better because in string theory, these divergences uh, which you have in the other series, the corresponding divergences are not there. So string theory is in that sense superior to the, mm, to the uh, quantum field theories that the string theory makes finite results. Avoid these stupid infinities, and in a way you could calculate on string theory in a more naive way, and it is giving finite results. So it's in a way much better. And this is very crucial because uh, the trouble is that if you extend the standard model with gravity, which you basically can try to do, then you get a theory with infinitely many parameters because the gravity tends to have infinitely many parameters unless you make special restrictions on it. And that means that if you should measure something to determine all the parameters of gravity, you would never finish because there are infinitely many of them. And therefore, gravity has better been taken away if you shall claim that the standard model is renormalizable in the sense that the standard model gives sensible results for sensible, um, for sensible uh, uh, questions. What does the book tell about gravity and standard model? Oh, I think it's mainly, a standard model we would mainly be introduction to it, because this is in a way, the standard model is not our, our, uh, our work. But what is, your, what is your wild dreams about gravity? Oh, gravity, you could claim uh, that gravity is getting a better theory in string theory than than almost anything because uh, it is very difficult to make a good series of gravity. People try. There are many gravities on the market, a loop gravity and gravity with small uh, lattices and uh, many 
uh, interesting uh, you, uh, ways and there uh, Plebansky and there uh, uh, ways of making somewhat non-local uh, propagators which are non-local and so on. I mean, there are many uh, uh, attempts to make uh, gravity better and avoid some of these divergence problems so as to make at least a sensible theory. But most of them are a bit arbitrary and therefore they are not so beautiful as to really deserve to be the truth. That doesn't, of course, really prevent them from being the truth or something similar to be the truth. But it, it is, um, it's not easy to find a very nice and at the same time finite theory for gravity. If you put infinitely many parameters, maybe you can just have such a flexible theory that it doesn't matter. I think I could claim with some right that this uh, string theory is a theory of gravity. And if you have string theory in the book, at least somewhat, then you have, in a certain formal sense, something that both with some right can be called my theory, because I was one of the inventors of string theory, and can be called a, a theory of gravity, because string theory has tended to predict uh, gravity essentially. So um, you, you get gravity out of string theory almost even if you don't like it. I could tell that in the old days, and this is what gets the more emphasized in a way in our book concerning string theory, but the old days because that was when I worked most on it, uh, um, uh, then we wanted to make string theory for um, for hadron physics and hadron physics, the physics, uh, this is physics of, of of particles like the proton and the pion, which comes out when protons collide, and uh, and for this kind of physics, we dreamed about making a good string theory, and one can to some extent do it uh, now. Uh, Paul Olsen and Makiyenko has uh, some uh, uh, attempts in this direction. But at that time, it was a bit of a problem that these string theories tended always to make a particle that was a graviton, that there was a state of the string which behaved like the particle you want in gravity. But such a particle is not wanted among the hadrons, because you have not found a gravity particle among the hadrons. So it was in a way that the string series tried to predict gravity even against the wishes of uh, people uh, like myself, hoping to make a theory of strings for hadrons, because in hadron physics you don't have a a graviton. You have an F meson, but the F meson has a mass and has more active components. So this is not a good graviton. Why did you write this book? Oh, I think uh, it is our own works. It's always nice to put forward one's ideas. There are many wild dreams about these molecules Henrik has worked with for several years, and there are uh, wild uh, dreams like the, the whole random dynamics is to a large extent wild dreams, and can probably count as several wild dreams because there are uh, small things, and there are uh, small ideas which probably are so wild that they are wrong, most of them, yeah. <laughs> An appreciable part of the book is about uh, studying large molecules. Uh, and Henry can study large molecules by, uh, by computers and by uh, trying to find out how they glue together, how they touch together, and 
this may be relevant for making medicine and so on. I'm doing many other things than just random dynamics. And sometimes I work on random dynamics a little bit in the secret because it may be that it is better to, when you go this and study one little law of, of nature after another and see if it comes back, you don't really have to tell so much that it is random dynamics because this is a good project in itself. And, and therefore, you can, when you get some idea of how it can do you, you, you may just uh, tell about that, as if it had nothing to do with random dynamics. What do you think that the future in physics will be? Yeah, in the near future, maybe this uh, standard model will, will work out to be very true. <laughs> so this is, I think, the shock that at the LHC, the standard model turns out to be so true that the great theories like superstring theory that might be behind, maybe they are still behind, but it could be that it is not going to be found in the first accelerators because it doesn't look so easy because in a way one would have hoped to find something already. So maybe one will have to, uh, to find some, uh, uh, some new physics based mainly on the, or, or one might find, uh, maybe that one could put even more into the, into the standard model. Personally, I am dreaming that we can understand the dark matter even in the standard model. Because we cannot do that today. No, only we. Uh, most people believe that to get the dark matter, which is astronomically observed, you uh, need to have some new physics, like, for instance, some supersymmetric partners of the particles uh, which we know today, uh, 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 and, and that these particles, some of them could then be the, uh, the, uh, the dark matter. That is a very realistic idea. And if one finds that this is indeed the type of thing we have, and that this is a dark matter, this would be considered a support for superstring theory. So this would be considered a support that string theory is really right. There are many ways you can get parallel universes in physics. You can have these um, uh, Everett parallel universes because of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. That's a very popular interpretation of quantum mechanics, that you, uh, when you make a measurement, the universe splits up. And if you make many measurements and you split up in, into as many results as the measurement could have, uh, they usually will have many possibilities. And of course, uh, very quickly we get very many universes. Infinite so, numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not necessarily infinite, but big enough. Close enough. <laughs> um, but there are also others, as for instance, baby universe theory, where you have small, uh, uh, small tunnels into other universes, and this is also a way of having many universes. Oh, the quantum mechanics problem is, of course, that you have this measurement problem. And if you have... Uh, I mean, this has been discussed between Bohr and Einstein for so many years that it is really <laughs> very old problems. But uh, almost all physicists uh, like Einstein and most of the people who made the quantum mechanics, they felt that quantum mechanics was somehow unsatisfactory. And, um, uh, and this is... Uh, because it is very close to being contradictory, and Einstein complained that it was not complete, and so on. Uh, 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 but uh, it is quite close to not being complete. For instance, uh, Niels Bohr put it with this uh, complementarity, uh, that you should have different pictures which are inconsistent with each other, but describes the same reality, or the same uh, yeah, reality, the same truth, the same physics. And 
And this is, of course, a possible uh, philosophical way to go. And in a way, it's a great thing, uh, philosophically. But it's not really attractive, because uh, uh, you, you don't like to have in contradicts a contradiction, a contradictional stories about the same. That, that's what we would be very unsatisfied with. And therefore, this is a kind of problem. I think this complementarity principle is basically not so attractive. And at least that's what most of the physicists feel. And that's why a huge amount of theoretical physicists want to um, to make better theories behind quantum mechanics, to explain away somehow uh, partly or completely this incompleteness of, of different stories describing the same thing. It's good to, uh, to learn something about these uh, things and to see how people are thinking and, and uh, it's a good thing to see the, um, the way people are thinking, how wild and how not so wild ideas are, so that you can see that this kind of things exist, even if you may not even think about it if you are not uh, yourself a physicist. You may not know how things are. So it might be good to, and, and, and the things that are review, and so that's things that, that everybody should know as a good education. So some of it is sort of what you ought to all know, and some of it might be examples on what you, uh, what people are doing, and this might be interesting even if it is not true. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and uh, always a uh, happy smile. <laughs> yeah, maybe we shall find better alternative answers to this. <laughs>